Uh, hi, my name is Irina. I am a team lead of payments now at Monzo and I'm going to talk about microservices. We use microservices. Uh, but before I dive into our architecture, well, first of all, uh, who, who heard of Monzo? Perfect. Who has a Monzo card? Good. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any with me, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, that's me, and that's my Twitter handle, and this picture was taken first time we shipped something in production uh, with actual payments, with actual bank accounts that moves actual money, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it's actually quite, it's a bit of a trend with avatars on Slack at Monzo, so we have, uh, it's funny to see the conversations between two people with both like, and things. So before I'm going to talk about our architecture, first I want to talk about what I love about Monzo as a company and as a product. And I'm genuinely excited on sales speech. So what the first thing uh, that brings to mind, and uh, that jumps to mind is we build a product that people love. It's really quite something special to work on a product that I use myself every day. I really want to move it forward and I see people around me using it every day too. Uh, we have, if you haven't seen one of our cards, well, first of all, it was in the previous slide. And also, this is how it looks like. It's hot coral. If you lose it on the street, it's very easy to find. Um, this is hot chip. Uh, secondly, we bring banking where, in where it's supposed to be in 2017. And it's not supposed to be in the queues in the branch. You're not supposed to go to the branch to ask a human person to book an appointment for you to open a current account two weeks in advance, only to tell you later that you don't have enough documents to open the current account. Um, and uh, the last but definitely not least, which is important for me, is we treat people like human beings, both customers and staff. If you ever interacted with our customer support, we, they do genuinely want to help you. We also, all of us do customers want, uh, from time to time, engineers, everyone, mostly because we grow so fast, we can't scale our customer support operations fast enough, so sometimes we just have to. But also it's an amazing experience to help people and to genuinely try to uh, solve their problems. I recently had an experience with Virgin Media customer support, so the contrast, <laughs> the contrast was amazing. Um, oh yeah, and of course we're making the world a better place. So what I'm going to talk about is two things. I'm going to give an overview of our tech stack and I'm going to go a little bit in details of how we approach the design of individual services. Uh, let's start with the tech stack. Uh, when I built these slides about three months ago, we had about 250 services. Now it's closer to 300 and all of them live in one repo. And it works. We don't check in any build artifacts apart from protobufs, uh, and I will talk about protobufs a bit later, so the size of the code base is quite manageable. Unlike Facebook, we don't need distributed grab to search through the code in our code base, so this works quite well for us. Uh, all of our services deployed as Docker containers on AWS. And as you might expect, when you deploy almost 300 services on AWS, it gets expensive pretty quickly. So that's why we use Kubernetes. Can I get a show of hands who's familiar with Kubernetes? Okay, good. So I'm gonna go through on a very superficial level of what Kubernetes is and what we use it for. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration tool is a tool that helps you manage your resources and your deploys, helps you scale and also manages service recovery. So what it means, you in a one piece of YAML config, you put in how many instances of the service you want to run, what is the, how many memory do you want to allocate, how many resources you want to allocate, and then the magic will happen for you. So it will automatically scale it up and down. It will manage the resources of your uh, EC2 instances on AWS and deploy your services, your containers in a way that is cost effective. If you saw any of the talks by Monza people, Oliver or Matt before, they have this graph when they show when we switch to Kubernetes and how, how the cost went, went down after that. So that was fairly effective for us. Um, all of our Docker containers communicate, deployed on and communicate over Kubernetes. So that's how we do it. Um, 
to go through uh, a little bit of details of what Kubernetes setup is like, what the terminology is. Each service is a pod, so each container is a pod. Uh, you can have as many uh, pods as you like, and the group of them form a replica set. Uh, one level above le replica set is a deployment, so that's where you, um, th where, where you put your config on. So the deployment is what you actually configure of how many, how much resources you want to have per replica set, how do you want to scale it, etc. And on top of all of that sits the service, which makes all of this available to the outside world. So if you want to assign a URL to it, that would be in the service config. The next is how our services communicate uh, with each other. Oh, by the way, the service, that it is a little bit confusing, the terminology, because we mean service as in service in our code base, one instance that we deploy, and also service in Kubernetes terms is not, not quite the same but you just have to get used to it. Uh, communication. So this is the uh, rough outline of what happens when you open your app and you see the graph, and the pulse graph of your spending and your feed. Uh, the, your app makes a request, which hits the load balancer, then it gets routed to the API service. It's fairly artificial distinction between the API services and quote unquote RPC services. The only difference is uh, API services just take the request from the outside world, transform it into a format understandable by the downstream services, and pass it through. That's all they do. Well, they might perform some validation and authentication as well. And then each service downstream can communicate to as many other microservices it needs to uh, form a response. Two types of communication that happens is synchronous, which happens over HTTP. We don't have a message bus for the regular communication across services, just plain HTTP. And for the asynchronous communication, we use Kafka and pretty much the standard PubSub model. So that might be uh, for something like login or error reporting or um, some events that services need to react to, but maybe not immediately. You don't need to return the response from other services to the um, end client. Uh, this is another, another example. So API payment service communicates with payment service, which in turn does all the things it needs to do. But of course the problem is, as we talked, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when there are multiple replicas of the same service, how does API service know which replica to hit in the payment service? That's where Linkerd comes in. So Linkerd is a um, service discovery software that we use that manages all of it very nicely. So we use Linkerd in conjunction with Kubernetes uh, for our platform. What do we use for storage? We use Cassandra. Who's familiar with Cassandra? Okay. So Cassandra uh, is a NoSQL database. It is just a distributed key value store, which is supposed to be and is performance scalable and full tolerant out of the box. And it has all of these things. Uh, it can be, switching from SQL to Cassandra can be a little bit tricky for a developer, uh, a developer like myself who didn't do anything like that before. But once you adjust your mindset, it works perfectly. Another thing that Cassandra uh, is often associated with is eventual consistency. So what does it mean? Eventual consistency means when you, because everything is replicated across uh, different nodes and across different data centers, when a write comes in, eventual consistency means that then the next read does, is not guaranteed to read the most recent data, which is probably not very good for a bank, right? This is my cat. This is a handcrafted cat picture. <laughs> Uh, but fret not, we, uh, Cassandra is great in a way that it allows you to uh, specify the right consistency per write or per whatever group of writes in, in configs. So what we use is a local quorum consistency, which means the write is not considered done until it, reach, it reaches the local quorum, until it's written to a local quorum. Local means in a data center, but because everything 
we run runs on AWS, we don't have that centers, means the availability zone. Doesn't mean to all of the machines in the availability zone, but uh, enough to have a local quorum. So that works for us as well. We use a bunch of other tools and just a few examples. So for uh, data analytics, we use BigQuery, Google's BigQuery. Uh, for basically everything that happens within the platform, we generate the analytics event that through Kafka goes through. Uh, there are a couple of services that are responsible just for publishing and transforming analytics event to a format that is uh, that makes sense for BigQuery, and then uh, they end up in BigQuery. For Arab reporting, we use Sentry, and for we also have a tool called S-log or structured log that we've written ourselves for blogging and blog discovery later. So let's talk about service design. How do we approach the design of uh, each individual microservice? We have three principles that we try to implement with every uh, single service, which are single responsibility, bounded context, and well-defined interfaces. And as long as you follow those three, everything works perfectly. So let's talk about them individually. Before we do that, uh, this is the typical structure of a Go Microsoft. Well, yeah, by the way, I, uh, I failed to mention that most of our services are written in Go, but not all of them. So we have a bunch of uh, front-end services, which is for our internal tooling, which are deployed in exactly the same way the rest of, uh, the, rest of the services are. And we also have um, a couple of services that are written in different languages. Um, we have a Scala service to communicate with one of our suppliers because suppliers. Um, and we have, and uh, now I believe we have deployed a Python service in production, which was written by, by one of our data scientists because Python is amazing for data analytics and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, one of the typical. Uh, Go services would look like this. Uh, not very big. Uh, the config folder, uh, and that's all like our monorepo looks like, just uh, 300 of these. Uh, config typically contains uh, Cassandra migration. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, Cassandra migrations are done quite manually, so if you want to add something, alter table, add a table, you just put a CQL in a file, and then you have to remember to run it before you deploy it, which I didn't a bunch of times. Um, DAO is a data access object, so all the code that is responsible for reading and writing to Cassandra lives in DAO. We use a um, Go library called GoCasa. How many of you, how many write, of you write Go or familiar with Go? OK, so it's completely relevant. That's fine. Um, Domain is all of the domain structs, domain objects that you might need. Handler is the meatiest part. That's where all of the endpoints, all of the actual handler functions live. And proto is a home for protobuf definitions, of which I'm going to talk a little bit later. So to the principles, single responsibility. As this helpful diagram shows, each of the services in this kind of path do only one thing and hopefully do it well. So, for example, payments, when you have an income in payment, you need to match an account number to an account ID. It doesn't go to Cassandra and fetch the account number by account ID. What it, do, what it does instead, it goes to account, it makes a request to account number service and gets account ID back. The same goes for Ledger, which, as you might imagine, one of the most crucial pieces in a bank. Ledger doesn't have any idea about any abstractions like payments, accounts, users. It just has Ledger, Ledger addresses, and um, it deals with that. So all of the services communicate with each other to get any data they need, apart from the data that is relevant just for this service. Bounded context. Um, these are examples for Go, because we use Go. So this is the typical uh, HTTP handler function, 
using that uses standard HTTP Go library. As you might have heard about Go, Go is fantastic for writing HTTP services. Um, it really is so out of the box in three lines. You can you can write an HTTP server. There are very very few things you can do with Go in three lines. So you should appreciate that. Um, it takes a request that returns a response. That's it. So HTTP request, HTTP response. Um, what we do, uh, we, for us it's a little bit more complicated because we have a microservices set up. We have our own library called Typhoon. It's uh, available on GitHub and essentially it's an RPC framework. It doesn't do a lot and now there are more RPC framework available for Go but at the time there weren't as many options so we have our own. So what does it do? It provides filters from in the Rails world where I come from. It was called middleware. So that can be authentication, authorization, filtering of whatever params. Uh, it provides routing and error handling and a bunch more um, handy functions, but that's about it. This is how our typical handler in one of our services looks like. It's very similar to the standard HTTP uh, server out of the box, except it takes Typhoon request and returns Typhoon response instead of HTTP request and HTTP response. So if you look inside Typhoon request, that's what you would see. It's actually just a regular HTTP request plus context. So what is context? Context is a Go package that provides uh, a couple of handy methods and, and um, values. So what do you use context for? You can use context for request tracing. Um, I will, I'm not sure how to switch back <laughs> with this mouse. But anyway, um, if you see there is a key value storage within the context struct, so you can put anything you want into, the, into this key value storage, including a unique request ID. And then you propagate this unique request ID to uh, child requests. And then if something breaks down and you look at the logs or, or you look at the stack trace, you can see where the request originated from. Uh, typically, context, not only in our services, but what also is advised by go uh, by the documentation of the package itself, is the first argument you pass to the functions when you call them for this purpose. Uh, you, can, uh, you can implement deadlines and timeouts with the context. So again, if you've seen the previous slide, there are a couple of functions like deadline. If you, you pass a time by which the context should be finished, and then you also pass a channel, which is a Go construct. I won't go into details. Basically, it is a mechanism to let a caller know that the context uh, exceeded its deadline. So then the caller can handle it somehow, cancel it or return, return there or whatever. And you can pass any number of uh, custom variables, not only request IDs, but whatever you want. So uh, this is basically a standard library in Go that uh, helps you handle a lot of the middleware stuff. Uh, the next principle is well-defined interfaces. And I have a riddle for you. What's common between interval, internal service packages and a toothbrush? You don't want anyone else using them. Exactly, you don't share them. <laughs> so you don't share internal packages in your service. And by packages, again, it's, it might be more of a Golang idiom. Every single folder you've seen in the slide with the, uh, with the, pack with the package structure is a separate package. You can call them whatever. In Ruby, they would be called modules. In Python, they also would be called mo modules, but for entirely different reason. Uh, the only package you share between two services is a proto package which is the definition of the interface description of the interface of the requests and responses for this service. 